So is there any philosophical progress? What does progress mean in knowledge? Is there progress in science? Science of physics today obviously is ahead of where the science of physics was 50 years ago or 100 years ago. There's no question about that. Well, that depends. In some ways, yes. But with Kuhn and others, the question of what progress in science really comes to is, is more complicated. I think one of the reasons why there's been a rebirth in interest in PERS and a rebirth in interest in pragmatism is that this new conception of PERS and pragmatism works reasonably well with the inherited analytic model. Analytic philosophy with its dog scientific dogmas of progress and uh, the close kinship of philosophy and uh, the sciences. There is a, a kind of, of um, vision about solving problems and it works very well in medicine and it works very well in physics. Analytic philosophy has so divorced itself from the problems of men, as John Dewey put it. You know, this sort of realism. Philosophy's job is to find out what is true. Philosophers talking to other philosophers bottled up in their little world, their little bubble, what constitutes the dominant members of the APA. And that's not the model of James, that's not the model of Dewey, it's not the model of Emerson, and Franklin, but it's the model that philosophy seems to have adopted. So our job is to find out what is true. William James essentially says that um, there can never be a final philosophy, there can never be a finished philosophy, that the mark of adequacy of any philosophy is that it has to find room for somebody else's experience. But it doesn't work very well in poetry. And it's a little bit like, uh, you know, has music improved since Mozart? Well, no one's going to really beat Mozart or Bach, but, you know, we have Brahms and Beethoven. And I don't know if they're better than Mozart, but I'm sure glad we have them. And it doesn't work very well in philosophy uh, or in painting. And the progress, you know, I've, I've just said no one's better than Plato, but we have a lot of other people to look at. So we have Plato, but we also have Kant and Descartes and Emerson uh, to think of, and that's certainly a good thing. We, we did that sculpture. We know that one's done, so we don't need to do that one again. Uh, so. It's a different kind of discipline. The questions philosophers pursue are of a different order than um, scientific questions. So how should we live? Uh, what can I know? Not just what do I know? Um, are so abstract and basic and fundamental that the idea of answering them and therefore making progress seems uh, the wrong yardstick to use. New issues come up, we think about ways of dealing with them. But you never get to the point where this particular issue is now buried. It seems to me that one of the crucial aims or responsibilities of the scholar, of the thinker, is to recollect. Uh, and recollect and not some passionless, neutral manner, but to recollect and engage in an engaged and passionate way. I tend to think that when we attend and attend with more uh, precision and more imagination, when we, as Thoreau says, uh, when we are able to have a true sauntering of the eye, so that you, you take in things, you are receptive in maybe some Heideggerian sense. I, that, that, could be, that, that, that could be for a person, for a group, that could open avenues of, of consideration, of reflection that were closed. If one asks, is there progress in philosophy? I think you can say yes, uh, in at least this way, that we can see what certain roads uh, lead to, and some of them are cul-de-sacs. Part of what you do when you study philosophy is you study some uh, wrong turns. When you realize that, uh, that there's so many philosophical positions 
uh, that have been debunked and appropriately so that are just not to be taken seriously, then surely we have made some headway in eliminating those positions. I mean, the time of James and Dewey, just defending the idea that, uh, which is still maybe the majority position philosophy, that the so-called secondary qualities like color are in some way in our minds, or they're just uh, powers in the object to produce certain sensations in our minds. And Russell and James and James and Dewey and then Russell following, he said James in 1915 were attacking that. But today I would say most workers in philosophy of perception in one way or another have something good to say about what used to be called naive realism. Some say in so many words that what they're trying to do is defend naive realism. And now we've moved to the next question, which is, well, how do you defend it? Which version of it, how do you work it out? Which was not even on the agenda. Part of the progress is, is maybe getting some names for or learning where you might be tempted to make some bad moves in philosophy. And I think we've gotten better at finding those, I don't know. We know what views to avoid like the plague because they've been shown on the whole to be tenable if you want to knock yourself out and you don't care about the consequences, but otherwise quite untenable. As we put forward more and more ideas and theories, we also have refutations or more refutations or we see some of the inadequacies of certain uh, positions and approaches. And so I think we, it's, we're more experienced as um, a culture. But does that mean that uh, we are at the truth or near the truth about a variety of important issues? I don't think so. And I'm not sure that that kind of uh, unequivocal single answer truth can be expected in philosophy in the first place.